Our ancestors' diets were rich in the essential vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients needed for optimal health. But today, thanks to declining soil quality, a growing toxic burden, and other challenges in the modern world, most of us are not getting enough of these critical nutrients. That's why I created Adapt Naturals. It's a supplement line based on the principles of evolutionary biology and modern research that closes the nutrient gap so you can feel and perform your best. Unlike most supplements, which use cheap synthetic ingredients your body can't absorb, our products are made with clinician-grade, bioavailable ingredients that make a real and noticeable difference. We have a full range of products, from the most advanced multivitamin and phytonutrient formula on the market, to a blend of eight organic superfood mushrooms, including reishi, chaga, and lion's mane, to a highly absorbable liquid D3K2 dropper. Our newest product is BioAvail Omega Plus, a blend of ultra-pure fish oil and the most bioavailable forms of curcumin and black seed oil in a single two soft gel serving. Fish oil, curcumin, and black seed oil are renowned for their powerful health benefits. But until now, they've only been available in separate products, which means higher cost and a lot of pills. BioVail Omega Plus gives you a natural and effective way to improve joint and muscle health, boost exercise performance and recovery, elevate mood and mental clarity, and regulate immune function. Head over to adaptnaturals.com, that's A-D-A-P-T, naturals.com, to learn more and start feeling and performing your best. Hey everyone, Chris Kresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. This week I'm joined by Oren J. Sofer, who is a good friend of mine. Uh, I've known him for many years and we used to work together in uh, various capacities. He teaches Buddhist meditation, mindfulness, and communication internationally and holds a degree in comparative religion from Columbia University and is a certified trainer of nonviolent communication and a somatic experiencing practitioner for healing of trauma. Oren's written a few different books. Uh, One of his best-known titles is Say What You Mean, A Mindful Approach to Nonviolent Communication, which we talked about a couple years back on the show. And then he has a new book out called Your Heart Was Made for This, Contemplative Practices to Meet a World in Crisis with Courage, Integrity, and Love, which I think is an extremely relevant title and concept for the world that we're living in today. And that's going to be the subject of our conversation in this episode. More specifically, uh, we're going to talk about his ecumenical approach to cultivating healthy mental and emotional qualities and connections to social change, including the health benefits of reducing stress and anxiety, engaging with burnout, and an overall orientation to health and well-being as a tangible and realistic goal in this uh, pretty hectic world that we're living in today. So I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Let's dive in. Oren, my friend, been a long time. It's so good to see you. You too, Chris. Thanks for having me here. So I was really excited to see your latest book come out because we're living in a, a time where you know most of the people I know feel like proverbial frogs in, in the boiling water, where it just seems like everything is intensifying you know the polarization that we see in social media the rancor and bitterness of dialogue around all kinds of topics the uh, global ecological economic crises that that we're facing inflation you know just people looking at their bill when they leave the grocery store and disbelief how much it costs just to feed your family and you know i i imagine that at various times in, in history, or if we're students of history, we know this is true, that people often do remark that, you know, their own time is the craziest time and things are, are changing too fast. And I do feel like there's something you, that's uniquely true about that in our time, like just the converging yeah. challenges of, you know, the economic and ecological crisis, as we just mentioned, AI, uh, social media, technology, it's, it's, it's difficult to be a human being in many ways in 2023. So well, well said, (laughs) tell me a little bit about the genesis of this book and what inspired you to write it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in part, everything you just said, (laughs) yeah, I feel like it's really hard to be alive and conscious 
on the planet today. You know, the there's there's a there's a saying for a reason, ignorance is bliss. It's a lot easier to go through the world in some ways with our eyes closed and our our heart shut. So if we are, if we're awake and if we're feeling, it's challenging, it's painful, it's scary. Um, and I think we all need resources. We all need not just the external resources, but the internal resources. And there's kind of two reasons uh, I wrote the book. I started writing it during 2020 when that really overwhelming series of events unfolded, starting with the pandemic and then uh, George Floyd's murder and the immense cultural and spiritual upheaval that brought. Uh, and then the wildfires out here in the West, which kind of brought the ecological crisis to the fore in a new way for millions of people. And it felt like one contribution I could make as a meditation teacher uh, and a communication trainer was to write about inner strength and the inner resources that we have that we can tap and cultivate. The other reason I wrote the book was um, we, we talked about my first book some years ago when it came out, Say What You Mean. And after teaching thousands of people to communicate better, what I have realized is that the mindfulness piece that was kind of revolutionary when I wrote my book and started teaching communication, I was like, wow, if we bring mindfulness in, it's so much easier to communicate. This is amazing. It's like, actually, there's a lot more that we need to communicate skillfully. We need patience. We need courage. We need honesty. We need compassion, empathy. And I wanted a way for people who are focused on their relationships and communication, whether it's in their personal life or in their work or move, working for social change, to have more of the inner skill set needed to make communication effective. So it's working on both levels for me. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I recall when we first met, we were teaching or involved with nonviolent communication. And one of the, I, w I wouldn't say it was a shortcoming, but I, I would say one, one thing I I didn't see enough of in the world of nonviolent communication as it was being taught at that point was it's, you know, it's, it's a powerful technique, but it, it, there's a lot more to it than a technique. And if you just apply it as a technique, it can actually backfire. Right. And we talked a lot about yeah. this where in order to communicate effectively, you have to develop a lot of capacities, which you just referred to and you've outlined in your book you have to be able to, first of all, pay attention, which was the first chapter in your book, and we're going to get into mm -hmm. that in a second. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not able to pay attention to your own reactions, you know, sensations, thoughts, feelings, and, and you're just getting carried away by those, then you're no matter what technique you're using, it's not going to be effective, right? So yeah. it sounds yeah. like you've taken this a lot further to identify and then help people cultivate the various qualities that they need to be a conscious, awake person in 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 the world to, that we're living in today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's let's just dive right in in there because um, you, you actually have twenty six traits <laughs> or qualities in the book. Of mm -hmm. course, we're not going to have time to go into all of those in detail, but I do want to start with attention because yeah. uh, as you argue in your book, it's it, it really is the foundation. Without attention, it's very difficult to cultivate any of the other qualities because you're, you're not able to monitor what's happening internally or externally without that fundamental skill of attention. So let's, let's begin there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's well known at this point that attention is not just a resource, but a commodity. And that there's a battle raging for our attention, because when you control attention, you can generate profit, and you can influence action. So it's a really radical thing to reclaim and take ownership of how we use our attention, instead of allowing our attention to be manipulated by social media, uh, by habit, by technology, to start to choose more consciously and intentionally where are we placing our attention? How are we using our attention? And what's the effect of that? So the whole process of really 
inner cultivation and contemplative practice, which is not something esoteric. It's not something that's just for people who identify as spiritual. It's really a foundational skill for living. That's about cultivating inner resources and having the skills to live a meaningful life and be effective in all of the areas of, of our life. The foundation of it is recognizing that we have the capacity to choose where we place our attention. And so the example that I, I give people to check this out in the book is something as simple as paying attention to what you're seeing in the moment and then shifting your attention to what you're hearing. And just, just noticing that we can do that at will, that we can sort of change the channel and then using that basic capacity, strengthening it through various exercises and trainings in order to more intentionally cultivate our inner world and the kinds of capacities that we're cultivating. Yeah. So it's an important point. Yeah. I, th I think the other, the other foundational point here that the whole, the whole book is really, is really based around is this, what gets talked about in modern neuroscience as neuroplasticity, what gets talked about in mysticism and contemplative practice as the, the malleability of the heart, mind, or consciousness, which is this, this fact that every day we are practicing something, we're strengthening something <laughs> based on how we're living. And so are we practicing feeling frustrated, irritable, stressed, petty, uh, or are we practicing feeling grateful, feeling patient, being kind, generous, loving? And how we use and place our attention plays a key role in that, in how we're relating to these different patterns and habits that come up in our in our life and in our, our person. Yeah, I had a teacher that used to be fond of saying the quality of experience is determined by the focus of our attention. Yeah, yeah. If our attention is fragmented and being pulled in many different directions throughout the day by notifications on our phone, email, ding, things, you know, all, all the sounds and beeping and flashing and the the hectic nature of life that we live. And if, if we don't do something to intervene and rein that in and create boundaries around the many different demands on our attention, then you can imagine what the quality of our experience might be in that context. Yeah, I love that. And, and I think that the, it's a, it's a very countercultural invitation because I think that so much of modern society tries to sell the idea that our sense of well-being or happiness comes not from how we're living, but from what we experience and what we get. It places our focus on the external trappings of our lives. And the, the point that you just made from one of your meditation teachers is very much the opposite. It's that actually so much of our quality of life and well-being and how we experience things has to do with the quality of our attention, how we're showing up, how we're relating. And there's this beautiful quote that I've heard in various places. It says, uh, to pay attention is an act of love. And, and I find that quite moving, you know, and, and this is one of the things I talk a lot about in my mindful communication work, which is just how powerful it is on an interpersonal level to really pay attention and give someone our full attention. And the same is true, just as you're pointing to for ourselves in terms of how we live and valuing our own time and energy enough to pay full attention and work against that force of distraction and fragmentation that's so endemic today. So I know, you know, just from conversations with patients and people in my life that a lot of people feel overwhelmed and anxious today um, about all of the various challenges that we talked about so far. And one objection uh, sometimes to this idea of like, what do you mean I can't be scrolling Instagram and Twitter all day? And, you know, I, what, if I don't do that, I'm not going to be current. You know, I'm not going to be current mm -hmm. with what's happening. I'm not going to be able to make a difference and, and, mm -hmm. and act in a way that uh, can lead to changes or I'm just not going to be informed and be out of the loop. You know, you talk a lot in your book about the importance of both, in, you know, individual practices that, to, to cultivate more attention and awareness and the other qualities mm -hmm. you mentioned, but also social change. And historically, mm -hmm. there's been a tension there 
in some contemplative practices, you know, work out your own salvation versus mm-hmm. versus is even a certain way of expressing it because I don't I don't see these as mutually exclusive and I know you don't either, but there can be this right. tension between like how do you stay engaged in the world and and work to help re- alleviate suffering and stay informed while also doing what you need to do to protect your own attention and yeah stay resourced so you can you can be of service yeah i mean you 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 know you summarize one of the key things there right is that the it's a false choice to say that we have to choose between however you want to language it self care wellness spirituality inner resourcing and social activism being engaged involved in our in our community that the two are not mutually exclusive and in fact as you pointed to they need each other and this is one of the aims of the book is to invite people into a really practical way of having our work for social change and our self-care support each other so service social change our work in the world, these provide a vehicle to express our love, our care, our values for the world and to work together to make the world a habitable place for our children and future generations. And contemplative practice, self-care, this whole sort of realm of what sometimes gets called inner technology provides a couple of really essential pieces. So one, it helps us stay resourced so we don't burn out. It takes so much energy, patience, persistence, dedication, courage, vision, hope <laughs> to stay engaged with our community and our world at any level, whether we're thinking about the PTA <laughs> in our community or working on the climate ecological crisis or looking at political polarization is hard work. And so we need a way to replenish ourselves. This is one of the essential roles of contemplative practice and self-care in social change and service work. The other piece is that it provides a a way of aligning means with ends. And this is the piece around what's known as uh, principled nonviolence, which is one of the things that I've been studying and exploring in various ways over my own life and practice, which is that the vision we have for not only our lives, but our world only comes about by living into it. The sense of, you know, the famous quote from Gandhi, you know, be the change you wish to seek in the world. Um, or whether we look at the world's spiritual traditions um, or Dr. King's statement that violence never brings about violence. Violence can't end violence. Hatred never ends through hatred, but only through love. So there's this sense that as we work for change in the world, if we're wanting to create a world where it's imbued with a sense of mutual respect, dignity, collaboration, how do we bring those values into the very process of working to create them? And that's what contemplative practice offers is a way of living that in our own person as we are trying to imbue our relationships and our communities with those values. Couldn't agree more. And I think I'm happy to see that this this conversation that we're having now, I think is one that has been growing and evolving over the past several years in contemplative practice communities. Um, and there's much more of an emphasis on engaged, uh, an engaged quality right. of practice, which is what exactly what we need now. If you've listened to this show for a while, you know that I'm a super active guy. Depending on the time of year, I'm either skiing, mountain biking, hiking, backpacking, surfing, or lifting weights on most days of the week. I also live in a really dry climate at high elevation. For these reasons, I pay a lot of attention to hydration. I've learned the hard way what happens when I get dehydrated, and I know how important hydration is to overall health. But hydration isn't just about drinking water. It's about water plus electrolytes. This is where Element comes in. It's a combination of electrolytes like sodium, potassium, and magnesium in easy-to-use individual packets that you just add right to your water bottle. 
And unlike most electrolyte products on the market, Element is free of sugar and artificial junk. I drink Element every day and it's made a huge difference in how I feel. Even with my training and profession, I don't think I realized how often I was dehydrated before I made Element part of my daily routine. If you'd like to try it, the folks at Element have an exclusive offer for my podcast listeners. You can get a free sample pack with one of each of the eight flavors Element sells when you purchase any Element product. This is perfect for anyone who wants to try all of the flavors or who wants to introduce a friend to Element. Just go to cresser.co slash element, that's L-M-N-T, to place an order and take advantage of this offer. Paleo Valley's beef sticks are definitely one of my favorite snacks. They're unlike anything else on the market. They're made from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef and organic spices, and they are naturally fermented, which gives them this really amazing flavor. In fact, they were recently voted in Paleo Magazine as one of the top snacks of the year. One reason I love Paleo Valley is that they're committed to making the highest quality whole food products that are free of junk ingredients. They're compact and easy to take on the go, especially when I'm out in the mountains and away from civilization. Go to paleovalley.com slash chris and use the code CRESSER15 to get 15% off. So in your book, Shifting Gears Slightly here, you mentioned 26 positive traits or qualities. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. I'm curious why you chose those specifically. Uh, Maybe you can give a couple other examples as well. And then there are not any chapters on what some, you know, what, some might refer to as negative or difficult experiences of being human, like fear, anger, grief, or sadness. <laughs> so, right. yeah. And I, yeah. I know you, so I know you're, you're certainly not a person to ignore um, the importance of working with those emotions. So I'm just curious about how, how this choice came about. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Hmm. So the number 26 is in some ways random. There's nothing perfectly special about it, but it, if you multiply it by two, you get 52 weeks of the year. So that that's where I got 26 from, is I wanted this to be a companion. I, it's not the kind of book that's intended to sit down and read over a weekend. It's the kind of thing I'm hoping people will read over time and use it to inform their their daily life. So if you devote two weeks to every chapter, you have a whole year of learning and training and deepening into our potential as human beings. The qualities themselves, many of them are drawn from Buddhist pedagogical lists and structures. The early Buddhist tradition is (laughs) rife with long lists of of different things because it was an oral culture. And so they use these lists to remember and memorize the teachings. Um, but not all of them. So uh, there are things like courage and uh, curiosity, kindness, renunciation. There's kind of classical meditative qualities like concentration and wisdom and mindfulness. But then there are things like like joy and rest and wonder and play, which I know we have a, a mutual fondness and, and appreciation for uh, contentment. So what I was looking at was what are the range of capacities we need as human beings to thrive and to be more effective in our lives? And one of the analogies that I like to use is if you think of the human organism as an instrument, how well do we know how to play that instrument? How familiar are we with the scales and the notes of human consciousness and the heart and the mind? And so if you think about like a high fidelity stereo system or something, you could have a great subwoofer, but if your mid and treble is off or you have really cheap speakers, you're not going to be able to appreciate the music as much. So looking at this whole range of things we can cultivate and experience and draw from in our lives. So that's where the, the 26 and this sort of journey through all these different qualities comes from. And then as as far as the negative qualities, the negative, I mean, the difficult ones, the painful ones, I mean, that's the bias right there, right? It's it's this sense of very this very deeply ingrained kind of biological pleasure pain principle of wanting to avoid the unpleasant aspects of our lives. 
the reason there aren't chapters on them is because I believe that we need a foundation of health and well-being and strength in order to work skillfully with and metabolize those difficult, painful experiences we have as human beings like grief and loss and fear and anger and jealousy. So what I'm trying to do in the book <clears throat> is to provide the nutrition, the, the nourishment for people to have the right inner environment to heal and integrate those difficult things. And I do talk about them in the different chapters. One of the analogies that comes to mind that I think you'll appreciate given you know, your work in functional medicine is this amazing quote I came across at some point from Louis Pasteur, who has said at the end of his life, if for listeners who aren't familiar, he's the one who discovered germs and is kind of the grandfather of germ, modern germ theory which of course was a revolution, but then has all of its limitations that you've talked so much about in your show. At the end of his life, he said, and I'll, I'll say it in French just because it's fun <laughs> and translated. He said, le microbe n'est rien, le terrain n'est tout. The microbe is nothing. The landscape is everything, right? Quite a shift for, for yeah. someone who is responsible for introducing the concept of of how microbes cause disease in the first place. Right, yeah. as in that focus, that hyper-focus of allopathic medicine on the pathogen. So in some way, I think that there's a corollary here when we look at psychology and emotional healing is there's this sense of what's the problem and then fix it, focus on the pain point rather than taking a step back and looking at, you know, well, do you have friends? How's your community? Do you experience joy? Are you getting enough exercise and rest and how, taking a more holistic uh, picture of our life? And so that's really why the book is framed around these more healthy qualities is to create a context where we can metabolize the difficult ones. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. It's sort of a resilience building approach where if you cultivate all of these qualities and take time to integrate them into your life that the it's not going to eliminate those difficult emotions or experiences but you'll be in a much more capable place when it comes to being able to ap approach them and work with them absolutely yeah exactly so one of the metaphors you use in the book is um, about seeds of consciousness mm -hmm. which i really love can you talk more about where this comes from and and why you chose it Sure. Yeah. So this concept comes pretty directly out of Buddhist psychology. Uh, I was introduced to it from Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Zen master, poet, peace activist who passed away a number of years ago. And it's the idea that in, in our mind, in our heart, however you want to think about it, we have these different capacities. So we have the capacity for joy, happiness, generosity. We have the capacity for hatred, fear, anger, jealousy, stinginess. And the question is, which, which seeds are we watering? What capacities are we strengthening? Which we've kind of touched on a little bit when we're talking about, about attention. There's also, you know, the, the Buddha was in ancient India, and this was an agrarian economy. So in studying early Buddhist texts, the metaphors are very earthy. He's looking at nature and drawing analogies for the wisdom and insight he discovered in the earth. And I just find seeds so mind-blowing. <laughs> this is a beautiful quote from Henry David Thoreau that I'll, I'll paraphrase is something like, I don't believe in miracles, but convince me that you have a seed there and I'm willing to expect wonders. This idea that, you know, from this very small blueprint of life, you know, a whole tree can grow. And so I, I think you, you know, um, my wife and I just had a child about a year ago and it's been such such a reaffirming and 
encouraging experience to see so many of these qualities innate like generosity you know i was on the couch with my son the other day and uh i gave him a slice of apple and he's kind of nibbling on it and then he hands it to me to take a little nibble and then he eats some more and uh, just to see his joy at being alive and exploring or the curiosity. And so these these are the seeds that we're born with, but that need to be developed, that need to be encouraged. And so the metaphor that is throughout the book is this invitation to kind of become a master gardener of our own heart and mind and grow the kind of garden that we want to live in. Yeah. I love that analogy, and I think it draws together a lot of the different concepts of the book and the importance of attention, where you focus the where what you water, mm-hmm, what mm-hmm. you don't, and and also the larger concept of in, in a garden. If you have, you, you're never going to get rid of all of the weeds or mm-hmm, pathogens, mm-hmm. And, and that's just part of a normal ecosystem. But if you if the soil's healthy. If there's plenty of water and sunshine, then yeah. those the weeds aren't don't become a problem. They don't get overgrown. Yeah, um, which, which of course we know this analogy from so many other areas too. The, the gut microbiome is another one in in my yeah. field. Yeah. It's not so much about eliminating aggressively all of the negative or potentially harmful influences. It's just creating this this much more resilient ecosystem that those positive qualities can grow out of. So I really love that. There's a phrase I I like just to kind of put a pin in this one, uh, the permaculture of the heart. Mm, Beautiful. Yeah, Yeah, I love that. I want to touch briefly on the role of trauma. Mm. You know, this is something that that in the last 10, 20 years specifically, we have much greater, more sophisticated awareness, I think, in in psychological circles also in in contemplative practices and Mm -hmm. in functional medicine about the the role that trauma plays and when we talk about cultivating positive traits and and we're you know it seems like at least touching on that is is helpful for people who are you know who are dealing with still to some extent a pretty significant level of trauma yeah yeah it's essential really and trauma is a specific experience and word and i think there's also a love a way in which there's a spectrum of trauma and it's it's my belief that most of humanity that's alive on the planet today is suffering from some effects of trauma on that spectrum somewhere on that spectrum just given the the challenges of modernity and the kind of dislocation of our modern lifestyle from what we are expecting kind of ancestrally and from an evolutionary bio, biological perspective. So drawing from the skills, the skill set of trauma-informed practice, I think is essential, as you're saying. And there, there are three main principles that I talk about at the beginning of the book that then run through the whole exploration. And so the first is starting from a place of relative safety and relaxation. You know, how we how we begin matters. Um, this principle is there in systems thinking and uh, other fields. And one of the main ways to do that is this very simple practice of orienting, which literally just means connecting to our environment through our senses. It comes out of Peter Levine's work and somatic experiencing. We find it in mammals in the wild that are prey. It's this sense of checking things out and knowing that we're safe. So starting from a place of relatively relative safety, wholeness, relaxation, that's the first principle. Second principle is start small and go slowly. <laughs> You know, take your time. And again, here, this is this is often this is countercultural. There's a huge emphasis on as much as possible, as fast as possible, go big. You know, there's a huge emphasis if we look in kind of the wellness industry on catharsis and having a big release. And this is a very different approach. 
the word that comes out of trauma healing is called titrating, which is just a fancy way out of chemistry that means take a little bit at a time because you might be working with ingredients that are explosive or react with each other in unpredictable ways. So um, exploring particularly difficult material, right? If we are looking at uh, deep sadness or fear or anger or grief to take those things a little bit at a time in small and manageable doses. So orient, start from a place of wholeness, go slow, take your time, titrate. And then the third principle is when we are working with, with painful or difficult experiences, to always keep close at hand something that's supportive, a resource, and to move back and forth in a kind of natural rhythmic way between the thing that's difficult and something more supportive or nourishing. And the technical term for this is called pendulating, just like a pendulum kind of swings back and forth if we are able to shift our attention from the place of challenge to something more supportive that stimulates our innate capacities for healing. Hmm. Love that. It, it makes a lot of sense to me uh, as a framework and having worked with many patients in that in that situation my my approach has been pretty similar you know different different sometimes different content but the the process is is very similar mm. so you mentioned uh Oren, that you recently had a kid which i'm aware of of course and congratulations again it's you're you're 13 months in so still early in the <laughs> process it's every every month is so different at that stage so for me, when I when we had uh, our daughter Sylvie, my you know, and, and most parents can relate to this. It, my life changed dramatically, and my perspective and outlook changed. My priorities changed. The way I spent my time changed. Um, so, what? How has this impacted you and your outlook? You know, the way you think about the future and just how you experience uh, your your life on a day to day basis. Yeah. Well. Well. First, just well said. <laughs> everything. Everything got turned upside down. It's been such a remarkable journey, and my wife and I joke about. You know, we're both in our forties, and we spent both spent many years doing spiritual practice, living in monasteries, going on retreats, doing therapy, and um, we joke around that we we traded energy for wisdom <laughs> to, some, to some degree, hopefully. Um, it's been really humbling. And I think it's brought out a lot of tenderness for me. It's been humbling to, on multiple levels, one, just I have such a deep and profound appreciation now, just for the miracle of any human being <laughs> getting born and surviving. It's so remarkable how much time and energy and care it takes to keep a human being alive and raise them. So there's this deep appreciation for the generosity of, of all parents, um, my own, of course, as well, and the miracle of life, a humility around my own limitations, you know, feeling pushed to my edges, and particularly as a meditation teacher, seeing the places where I run out of patience or where I get angry or frustrated. Um, and that's that's just been a tremendous teacher. And also, uh, as I kind of alluded to before, it's just reaffirmed this deep faith in the goodness of humanity. That just seeing not only the innate goodness in our son, but how uh, his utter vulnerability and innocence calls forth so much goodness not just in ourselves, but in strangers. You know, I, I walk down the street with him stra strapped to my chest in a carry and, you know, complete strangers just light up, just beaming. <laughs> and so it's this reminder on a daily basis of the power of vulnerability to recollect the goodness in our hearts and I just learned, I learned from him on a daily basis about all of the stuff that's in this book, about mindfulness, about rest, about letting go, about patience, about devotion, about, about wonder, about compassion for myself, as well as for him. 
So it's just a tremendous gift to have this reminder all of the time to uh, be present, to be intentional about how I'm living, and to use my time well. Yeah, I often tell people, uh, Sylvia is my deepest teacher, my most exacting mm -hmm. teacher. Mm -hmm. Un uncompromising. <laughs> you know, sitting and staring at a wall for 10 days is luxurious um, com compared to the trials and tribulations of being a parent. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the last piece, and you mentioned this in, in your, your question, um, it's inviting me into a more honest and deep relationship with a lot of the painful aspects of our world, you know, and I am not looking forward to how to have conversations with him about racism, colonialism, genocide, <laughs> war. I mean, you know, um, the, uh, thankfully there are wonderful resources today for how to have those conversations with our children. And and then looking at the future, you know, so looking into the present moment deeply and seeing all the challenges that we started the conversation off by naming and and feeling the vulnerability of that. And so his presence in my life, it extends the horizon, right, of how I see myself and provides a different level of compassionate investment in in my work. Yeah. 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 Very similar for me. And I, I do feel like if, you know, we are going to make it out of the mess that we're in, it's going to be because our children are able to mm -hmm. um, meet and respond to these varying crises and crises in a conscious way. And so, yeah, this is these are the times we live in, and we can only just do the best we can to respond yeah. to them and, and prepare our children for what they're going to be living into. So, Oren, um, thank you so much for the conversation today. The book is "Your Heart Was Made for This: Contemplative Practices to Meet a World in Crisis with Courage, Integrity, and Love." Where can people learn more about it and pick up a copy? Yeah, so the book is available in bookstores everywhere. If they order through my website, orinjsofer.com, there's some uh, nice free gifts, a little discount and some bonus guided meditations. And that's where folks can find out more about my work, my other books and how to stay in touch. Great. Pleasure to see you again. It's been too long. And, yeah. Um, yeah. You look forward to look, look, uh, I really enjoy the book and look forward to staying in touch and continuing to have this conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. And thanks again for having me on the show. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Keep sending your questions to chriscresser.com slash podcast question, and we'll see you next time. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.